Well, welcome back to class. If you have your Bibles open to Deuteronomy chapter number 23, Deuteronomy 23, verses 12 through 14 is where we're going to read. I want to congratulate the graduates for graduating Friday night. Now, I think this lesson is probably going to be the most unique lesson that you will ever have in your life. This is definitely going to be a unique one, and you may never have another lesson like this, but this is what the Lord's laid on my heart, and so this is what I believe He has for us. So if you have your Bibles open to Deuteronomy chapter 23, we're going to begin reading in verse number 12. Deuteronomy 23, verses 12, and we'll read through verses 14. It says, Thou shalt have a place also without the camp, whither thou shalt go forth abroad. And thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon, and it shall be when thou wilt ease thyself abroad, thou shalt dig therewith, shalt turn back, and cover that which cometh from thee. For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp to deliver thee, and to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore shall thy camp be holy, that he see no unclean thing in thee, and turn away from thee. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this wonderful day. Lord, thank you for the opportunity we have to open your word and to hear from you and to learn more about you, Lord. I pray that this lesson that you laid on my heart, that it would be exactly what we would need and that it would speak to the hearts of anyone that listens, maybe tomorrow or 10 years from now, Lord. I pray that it would have the desired effect that you want it to have, Lord. I pray you would fill me with your power and use me, Lord. And I pray that you would just bless this time that we have today, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Here I have, we're going to talk about, from these verses, talking about, kind of want to talk about sewers at first, and we'll transition into the lesson. Like I said, this is definitely going to be a unique lesson, but here I have the history of the sanitary sewers in the Middle Ages. We'll start Deuteronom- the Deuteronomic Code in Deuteronomy 23.13. As we just read, it says, And thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon, and it shall be when thou wilt ease thyself abroad, and thou shalt dig therewith, and shalt turn back and cover that which cometh from thee. Let's see, 25% or more of the ancient European population died of disease like cholera, the plague, etc., the major transmitter of the plague was rats. Actually, uh, actually, bacteria conveyed from rats to people via flea bites. Rat population thrived amongst the mess and stench commonplace in medieval times. Bodily functions were performed anywhere at any time. The British Royal Court posted a warning to let no man, whoever he may be, before, at, or after meals, early or late, foul the staircases with filth. Erasmus, in 1530, said it was impolite to greet someone while they were going to the bathroom. If you see someone relieving themselves, you should act as if you had never even seen them. I think that should just go without saying. But larger European cities, uh, they had dreadful filth and stench. It was everywhere. You couldn't go anywhere without smelling or running into filth or stench. Let's see. In 1670s, piles of garbage were accumulating that a new law was enacted which required visiting peasants to take some garbage home with them to not clutter the streets. Chamber pots were emptied into the streets. So basically they had a a bucket and they would just throw it in the streets not even think twice about it. New courtesies evolved during this time with the gentlemen when escorting ladies positioned themselves closest to the street, thereby positioning themselves rather than the ladies nearer to where the sewage would hit the ground after being thrown out of a second story window. Let's see, in 1583 they built public bathrooms and people were charged for their use. Separate toilets for men and women first appeared at a restaurant in Paris in 1739. During this time, tours of the sewers were given by the sewermen on weekends. 
I don't know why someone would want to take a tour of the sewer. I personally, I wouldn't, but that's what they did for fun. That's what they did. On weekends, they were given tours of the sewer. Why? I don't know. London's early sewers were basically open ditches sloped to convey the waste to the Thames River, thence out to the sea. These ditches received everything that people could throw into them. King Henry VIII decreed in the late 1500s that homeowners were responsible for cleaning that portion of the sewer on which their property fronted. He also created a commission of sewers to enforce these rules. However, it was not until 1622 that the commission was seated. Uh, early sewage problems were compounded by a lack of authority to compel landlords slash property owners to connect the building to the sewer. That changed in 1847 following several outbreaks of cholera. At a well at 40 Broad Street was found to be contaminated with sewage from a nearby overflooded flowing bathroom. The well was removed from service and the cholera outbreak ended. That's very important to the lesson and we'll come back to it. Basically, they found a well, and they realized that that well was infected with bacteria from an overflown bathroom that had flowed into the well and it infected the water. People were drinking that, and they actually became sick. Well, when they stopped using that well, the outbreak ended. In 1858 to 1859, years of the big stink in London. Those were the years of the big stink in London. The Thames River received waste of thousands of people who lived upstream of Parliament. Many of the sewers tributary to the Thames River could only physically drain during low tide. The problem was that at low tide, the river did not have enough flow to carry the waste downstream and out to sea. The incoming tide pushed the waste upstream. This cycle resulted in the river becoming virtually a wide open to the sunlight cesspool for the excrement of nearly three million people. Parliament had to shut down often in summer months. The situa situation created an even greater problems. The Thames was also the source of water for a large portion of London. So they would drink out of this river that they were just throwing all their waste and stuff into. They would drink out of the same water, which that's disgusting. During these years, various ways to minimize sewer odors were tried, including the addition to the sewers, especially in warm weather, of large quantities of lime or chloride of lime. Sometimes this helped. At times, the draperies in the Parliament building were treated with the chloride of lime to help filter out odors when odoriferous breezes came into the building through the open windows. That didn't work out all too well. 1866 was the year of the last cholera epidemic in the London area. So we see that they had some problems early on in the medieval times, in the Middle Ages, trying to come up with a good sewage system. Here in verse number 12, it says, let's see, Deuteronomy 23, 12, it says, Thou shalt have a place also without the camp, whither thou shalt go forth abroad. And thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon, and it shall be when thou wilt ease thyself abroad, thou shalt dig therewith, and shalt turn back, cover that which cometh from thee. They were, to, they were to have a place away from the camp, said outside the camp, we see it says without the camp, that means outside the camp. They were supposed to have a place outside the camp where they would go, and then they would take care of business, and they would come back. Now why were they supposed to have a place outside of the camp? What's the big deal about that? They were to separate themselves from the filth they weren't exposed when they did that when they separated themselves when they had a place set aside okay this is a place that will go for this when they had that separated i don't know maybe it was 500 yards whatever the case may be they had a place separated outside of the camp and that's where they would go and it was solely used for that when they did that they weren't exposed to diseases such as cholera or like we read in the plague with the well when they discovered that it was infected with bacteria from the sewage. They stopped using that and the outbreak ended. It ended because they weren't exposed to diseases anymore. They separated themselves from that. 
not only did they not only were they not exposed to the diseases anymore it just kept all the noxious fumes and the foul odor out of the camp and i'm sure now i know from experience i've been at the farm i grew i worked on the farm for a couple years and in the summertime i remember one time we had this horse that hurt his leg couldn't go out so it was in its stall probably four or five six months never went out it was in there 24 7. now this horse was also kind of sketchy he, he kind of weird and they always made me clean it well i remember one time literally we had a pile from cleaning out that stall that was probably up to here on me and you'd put your pitchfork in it and it was hot it was summertime and it had been cooking and those fumes would just hit you in the face and you it'd make you want to pass out it was so bad now when they had those sep when the children of israel had a place separated outside the camp it, it kept all the fumes from coming back into the camp and just smelling up the camp and it made the camp more presentable and more I guess enjoyable for the children of Israel. They didn't have all the fumes and the odors mixed in the camp. It just kept the camp presentable. Could I make a comparison here? Would it be okay if we compare sin to sewage? Do you think that that would be a fair comparison to compare sin and sewage? I'd, I'd say that's a pretty good comparison. We as Christians need to separate ourselves from sin. You no, know, maybe there's a certain area, you know, the Bible talks about in Hebrews a besetting sin, and it's different for each and every one of us. If you struggle with something in your life and you know what it is, you need to take every effort you can and do everything you can to try and put as much distance between you and that sin possible. What did Joseph do when Potiphar's wife grabbed him and tried to sin with him? He ran the other way. He ran the opposite direction. He put distance between him and the temptation. He determined long before he was tempted what he would do when he was tempted. We, as a Christian, need to have a plan to not put us in a situation to be tempted. Romans 13, 14 says, Romans 13, 14 says, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. What are we doing when we put, when we have a plan and say, I'm not going to do this because I'm not going to put myself in a, tempt, in a place to be tempted. What are we doing? We're separating ourselves from that filth so it doesn't come back and make itself known in our lives. It doesn't, we're putting ourselves, we're separating ourselves just like God told the children of Israel to do. They were to have a place outside the camp they were supposed to separate themselves from that, to not be exposed to diseases and certain things. When we say, I'm not going here because I have a problem with this and I'll be exposed and I'll be tempted. When we do that and we separate ourselves from that, we are not making provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 tells us to flee fornication. 1 Corinthians 7, 2 says, nevertheless, to avoid fornication we as christians need to avoid flee and separate ourselves from sin you know we are all going to be tempted it's just it's a fact we're all going to be tempted at times even jesus was tempted but you know you don't have to put yourself in a situation to be tempted you don't have to if you have a problem drinking you don't have to go to a restaurant and sit at a bar to have you may just be watching the game and you're going to have a soda and some wings or something. But if, if you sit at that bar, you're putting yourself in a situation to be tempted. And you're making provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. You're putting, we as Christians need to put as much distance as we can between us and sin so that we don't fulfill the lust thereof. Not only were they supposed to separate themselves from the filth, but we see here in verse number 13 that they were supposed to cover the filth. Verse 13 says, And thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon, and it shall be, when thou wilt ease thyself abroad, thou shalt dig therewith, and shalt turn back and cover that which cometh from thee. And they were supposed to cover what came from them. 
following the same comparison of sewage equals sin, comparing sin and sewage, just as they were supposed to cover the waste that came from them, we as Christians need to cover our sin. And by covering, I'm not trying to say, oh, we're supposed to cover it up and hide it and don't let anyone know that it exists and just act like, oh, it doesn't exist or nothing's wrong. I don't mean that when I say covering it. I mean getting them covered by the shed blood of Jesus and allowing him to remove them as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again. Psalms 103, 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Hebrews 8, 12, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Genesis, go to Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to read verses 1 through 11, Genesis 3, 1 through 11. I want to make a comparison here to a story that we find in Scripture about Adam and Eve when they sinned in the garden. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1, and we'll read down to verse 11, and then we'll skip over to verse number 21 and read that as well. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. The woman said, un And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden, in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And then skip down to verse number 21. Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. We see here Adam and Eve, in verse number 7, they sinned, they ate of the tree that God had told them, Thou shalt not eat of. We see that the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. We see that when they sinned, their eyes were open, and they knew that they had sinned. So what did they try and do? They tried to cover their sins by making coats of fig leaves. We know they couldn't hide their sins from God. We know from reading the Bible that God knows everything. He knows our thoughts are far off, and even when we're in the dark, it's like day to Him. We cannot hide from Him. We can't hide anything from God. We know that. Yet they still tried to cover their sins, and hide themselves from God. He knew what was going on. And we see in verse number 21 that he killed an animal and covered them with skins. This story rings true today because a lot of Christians tried to hide their sins instead of confessing their sins. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Just as God knew Adam and Eve were trying to hide their sins, He knows what you are trying to hide. Confess it and get, get it covered by the blood of Jesus. We know the promise in 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We see that in verse 21, that God killed an animal. I've heard some people say it was a lamb, but we don't know. It doesn't tell us. But we see that God killed an animal and clothed them with the skins from that animal. And that, I believe that's a picture of Jesus dying on the cross and that his blood covers our sins. Why go to all the trouble of separating the filth 
and then covering the field. Why go to all of that trouble? Well, if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse number 14 gives us the answer to that. Not only we see they were they were supposed to separate themselves and then cover the filth, but why were they supposed to do that? Verse fourteen says, "For the Lord, or for the Lord thy God, walketh in the midst of thy camp to deliver thee and to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore, shall thy camp be holy, that he see no unclean thing in thee and turn away from thee." Verse fourteen tells us that the Lord walked in the midst of the camp and he wanted the camp to be holy holiness that was what the lord wanted the lord would walk in the midst of the camp says and he would fight their battles for them but if they didn't follow his commandments and had so to speak poop piles all over the place he would turn away and he would not fight their battles i mean can you blame him though do you have you ever walked in like maybe gone to a park or your neighbor's yard or something walking through it and you have to watch watch where you step because of all just the waste and everything there's little surprises all over the yard and you don't want to step in it i mean here this is what god's saying that he didn't want to see any unclean thing in the and turn away from the first peter 1 16 says because it is written be ye holy for I am holy. As Christians, God wants each and every one of us to live holy lives. God doesn't want to have to watch where he is walking, so to speak, when he is. We know that he's living inside of us because the Bible tells us that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which liveth and abideth in us. And God doesn't want, just like he didn't want any unclean thing in the children of Israel in their camp, God does not want any unclean thing in us. He wants each and every one of us to live a holy life. Does he see unclean things in you? Do you have things, sin, that is not covered? Have you separated yourself from sin? Does he see unclean things in me? Does he have to turn away from fighting our battles because of all the filth and stench that sin brings in our lives? Or are we holy? You know, maybe today you Maybe you need to take a look inside and like the Bible, like David asked God to examine himself and see if there be any unclean thing in him. You know, maybe we need to spend some time this week to ask the Lord to examine ourselves and to show us and see if there's any unclean thing in us. And then we need to separate ourselves from that and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Not only that, We need to cover it. We need to get it covered by the blood of Jesus and ask him to forgive us. And like the verse in Proverbs says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but he he that confesseth and forsaketh shall have mercy. If you confess it and forsake it and get get it covered by the blood of Jesus, then he will forgive you and then you will have a holy life. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this time. Lord, I pray that you would take this lesson that was brought today lord and i pray that it would be a help to each and every one of us who listens to it tomorrow or in the future lord and i just pray lord that you would take it and that we would apply it to our lives lord and that you would work through it lord i pray that you would please be with pastor and help him and i pray lord that you would please help the graduates as they go on lord i pray that you would just please lead them and guide them lord in your name i pray amen